Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 148 of Stand Up. Joining me at about 8 minutes and 50 seconds in is journalism professor Jeff Jarvis. If you want to get through my blathering about the news and other updates, Jeff Jarvis, journalism professor at the Craig Newmark School of Journalism. Always a fascinating conversation with him. And then author, business owner, storyteller, and woman who just lost her father just after he'd made parole and was over 15 years in prison. Hambry Cruz, and that interview begins at 54 minutes and 20-some seconds. You ready to stand up? Let's do it right now. Well, if you are listening on Tuesday, the 21st of 2020, it is day 1279 of our long national nightmare, 105 days until Election Day, and I've got a great couple of guests for you, two fantastic conversations. Joining me today, Jeff Jarvis and Cambria Cruz. Jeff and I talked about politics, COVID-19. We talked about uh, media and even a little bit about aging. He's always great, dynamic. He can talk about anything. He's one of my all-time favorite commentators and guests now on this show. Folks love when he joins me and We just had a really thoughtful conversation I think that you're going to be able to appreciate and relate to and even learn from because Jeff's a real smart guy. And then I talked to Cambria Cruz, who is a fascinating woman. She is, I met her because she is the wife of my friend Christian Finnegan, who joins us almost every Friday right here on the podcast. And she has a heartbreaking story to tell, but I think an important and, uh, and inspiring story and one that's enlightening about prison and really, frankly, about life. And I'm very excited to bring that to you as well. She just lost her father to cancer while he was in prison after several years of his 20 year sentence and uh, getting towards the end. He was paroled. But they wouldn't let him out, and she tells me why. Two fascinating conversations, important conversations. I'm very happy to bring both of them to you today. Also, uh, I'm up late taping this because I talked to this guy, Cameron, who is now also a subscriber to the podcast. Cameron, welcome. Thank you. Got to give shout out to all the subscribers. I forgot to do that. Oh, man. Got back to a bunch of you today, but I'll get the names and give you shout outs tomorrow. Late and I talked to Cameron for about an hour and uh, like 20 minutes. Uh, but I'm gonna have to post that I think tomorrow or the next day. Got a lot of people scheduled to be on the podcast this week, but we had a really interesting conversation and argument because I call him a maybe Trumper. Cameron, a Canadian guy that moved to America, and anyway, it was interesting, so that kept me up late as well. Crazy day as it is every day here in America in 2020. I was sad to hear it this evening that Michael Brooks suddenly passed away. He is probably one of the sharpest commentators of politics and a guy who I had a great deal of respect for. Young guy, couldn't have been maybe 40. I don't know what happened, but uh, he was part of Sam Harris's network, the Majority Report. Sam one of my favorite commentators as well. And I'm not sure exactly what the evolution of Michael Brooks was. I didn't know him, never talked to him, never met him, but I sure was a fan of his. I read a couple of uh, tweets here about Michael. Michael Brooks inspired many and won over hearts because he was as real as they come. He was a top-tier broadcaster and one of the left's most thoughtful talkers. He lived by his morals above all else. And then, uh, and he, this guy also, we could all stand to be a little bit more like Michael Brooks was, rest in power. Then also, here's another tweet. Michael Brooks' boundless empathy for all people made him a true radical. I can gladly attest to being one of his converts. Michael offered the kind of moral leadership that is most noticed in its absence, selfless, universal, and resolute. And this is a clip from him and his stream last night. Apparently, I don't, again, I don't know what happened, but here he is just last night saying very thoughtful, thoughtful things. What does it actually mean to be truly global to the extent we can, local, national, and international simultaneously, east, west, north, south, but from a place of actual growth and empathy? And this is where, again, this this questions of consciousness come in. The questions of cultivating empathy, cultivating compassion, cultivating awareness, the complete antithesis of social media modes long-term thinking, compassion, seeing complexity, comfort with oneself, solitude, 
the opposite of instant gratification, the attempt to constantly humanize and not dehumanize your fellow humans. These are all completely countervailing forces to the market technologic that subsumes all of us today. Smart guy, huge loss. Look up all of his old stuff. He was quite the philosopher and a a real moral leader. I realize I didn't say much uh, about John Lewis yesterday, and I feel like there's just so much that's been said about him. Living legend, he absolutely changed my life by making me feel like I'd arrived by getting the chance to interview him. And I can't say anything more about him that's been said by so many amazing people who knew him well and memorialized him. So sometimes I don't really talk too much about people after they're gone on this show because I feel like others are going to do a much better job. So I want to try to focus on what I'm decent at. Anyway, I don't I don't know as many people are going to be talking about Michael Brooks as did, of course, John Lewis. But I want to make sure I mention him because I was a pretty big fan of his. Also, last week I had Fed Ingram and Andrew Sparron, they're the president and vice president of Florida Education Association. And news yesterday is that that union, largest one in Florida, largest teachers union in Florida, filed a lawsuit Monday against Governor Ron DeSantis over his administration's push to fully reopen all public schools next month, even as coronavirus cases in the state are spiking. So I was really happy to, to hear that they took that action. Good luck to you guys, and I'll try to get the video of that interview posted as soon as possible. Also, uh, mourning the death of civil rights hero John Lewis, Democrats are now urging the Senate to take up a bill of enduring importance to John Lewis throughout his life, protecting and expanding the right to vote. We'll see if the Senate takes that up, not to mention uh, renaming the Edmund Price Bridge after him, but we've got to do a lot more than that. As Reverend uh, Barber says, you can't just name a bridge. You need policy, and this would be a, a good start. A uh, tragic story out of New Jersey. Did you hear about this? Let me hear about this. Hear about this. Oh, my old Jay Leno impression, sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, actually, that's uh, my old producer, Alfred Schultz, old Jay Leno impression that I stole. I used to love when he did that. Uh, authorities believe an attorney found dead in New York on Monday was the shooter who killed a New Jersey federal judge's son and wounded her husband. Law enforcement of sources with knowledge told NBC New York five law enforcement officials identified him as Roy Den Hollander, a well-known New York lawyer who has a long history of anti-feminist work. He was one of these pro-men's right Guys, a lot of conspiracy theories abounding from smart people I trust uh, about the connection between Bill Barr, Jeffrey Epstein, Donald Trump, this judge. It's just it's all too much, but it's all going to come out at some point. I talk with Jeff Jarvis about that. We get into it. All right. I am really out of time to say much more than that here at the top of the show. Uh, Thank you very much for tuning in today. Thank you for supporting the show. I can't do it without you. I am the editor, the host, the booker, the promoter. I am wearing all the hats and I'm not complaining, but I need your support. A lot of new subscribers coming in and I can't thank you enough. If you haven't subscribed yet, now is the time. Here is your opportunity. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or go to the paid subscription link in the show notes. Okay, let's get to my first guest. He is a professor at the Craig Newmark School of Journalism He is also an author and a commentator and a speaker. He's awesome on Twitter, and he's a a journalist. BuzzMachine.com, check him out. Follow him on Twitter right now, at Jeff Jarvis. I so love talking with him. Here is our latest conversation. There you go. (laughs) All right, I've got Jeff Jarvis on the phone right now because my uh, studio is is, is messed up, uh, so it'll have to be. Are you... Are you in? Are you like? Are you in the in the yard now? Um, uh, are you sitting on a tree stump trying to do cyber things? Uh, what, what, give me the picture of what this looks like. Close. You're getting. You're you're very warm. So basically, I'm in a an extra bedroom bedroom that we have. It's kind of like in my wife's office slash uh, where I generally sleep because I sleep separate from my wife. What do you think of that? And, oh, I do yeah. too. Storing, storing. Um, everything. Every yeah. single variable. Bad hours, Listen, snoring. my wife is the best person in the world when she's had a great night's sleep. Whatever it takes to give her that night's sleep. Also, I don't think, Jeff, <laughs> yes. I don't, I true, think it's, if true, you think about true. it, other than sex, there's really not too oh, many. No it makes no sense. You've th- yeah, it doesn't make sense to sleep next to another person every night. Unless, unless. Like my parents, it's like you you can't sleep without that person. Like my parents, uh, like 
uh, spoon naked after like 40 years. So, oh, yeah. Oh, uh, that's yeah. true. That's TMI for me. Is it and really? My Is it really? Oh, yeah. oh, oh okay. Yeah. I don't want to right. <laughs> No, I will tell no. them. I will send you a photo and video. So, no, no, no. yeah, so I'm just in this kind of make, sh- you know, this. But so, so are you remaking the shed we've seen you in? No, I'm remaking. So there's a shed outside separate from the house. It's a she shed, but it's a he shed. I think. I don't think gender matters. That's that's you using gender, not me. <laughs> <laughs> she shed, he shed, man cave, her cave. So, um, yeah, it's a she shed, and she's going to be broadcasting from there. It's going to have air conditioning and heating Ooh. and Ooh. internet, and it's going to be. Is it going to have a wall of all of your wonderful benefactors? I'm going to name it um, after my yes, my. Mo- I'm going to name it maybe after the guy, the listener and and supporter who is helping me build it. His name is uh, Nick De Fabrizio. So I'm thinking about calling it the Defab. But he 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 doesn't like that because he's very modest. He, if anything, he says you have to call it the old fart because he's sixty three years old. But either way, yeah, I may that was you had this great idea, and I am still definitely considering it. You know, people uh, uh, somehow donating to the uh, construction of the shed, and they get their name up on it. If that would matter to them, that'd be really cool. So yeah, I'm very excited about it, and uh, I'm ex- most excited that it has windows that I can look out onto my garden. To me, that's paradise. That's that's yeah. Nice. So so I I interrupted you for this entire beginning. To find out your status, go ahead. You're the boss. No, that's all right. Now everybody knows. So if they don't know already, I, I've, I've been talking about it a little bit. So lots that I want to talk with you about tonight. But first of all, you and I have discussed before um, and a number of times this issue of minority representation in the media, especially when it comes to TV. Yep. And and it's pretty exciting because we're talking here on a Monday night. This airs on Tuesday. But this is the first night that Joy Reid's show will air on primetime, oh, 7 p.m. Hallelujah. at long effing last. Yeah. So what is h- how do you talk about the significance of a black woman being at 7 p.m. Na- uh, on, on national news? So as a Democrat, as someone hoping for sanity in this country, the rescue of the party and thus the nation is going to be African-American women. And to take advantage of, to exploit, to to presume that we're going to have their support is ridiculous without also hearing their voices, hearing their concerns and their issues, treating them with respect. And so I don't want to put that entire weight on Joy Reid. It's not her responsibility alone, but, <laughs> yeah. but it's a minimum, a minimum that MSNBC, the liberal network, and it is that, should have on – a, an assured African American voice in prime time every damn day, and the other thing about about Joy Reid is no one but no one but no one on all of television does a better job of booking with her staff, and it's a new staff now, but with her staff um, voices who were not heard on white mainstream media, and now is the time we must hear those voices. We must care about their issues. We must answer their concerns. We must effing mean it, and because because they are our rescue. No way about it. It's old white men like me and you, almost old white men like you, uh, have screwed up the nation, and we've got a hand over now, and it's time. Almost old white men. What is the threshold for old? When do you get old? What age? Uh, it's 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 hair coming out of your ears and your nose. Oh well, I got the That's ear the thing. I got the ear thing going. Nose, yeah, you're, you're, you're getting there, man. You'll Not get there. You'll get there. Yeah. Um, you say that M- MSNBC is the liberal network. I don't disagree with that. Did you see a couple weeks ago when Chuck Todd claimed there's no bias at M- MSNBC, no editorial point of view on any of his um, the newscasts? I guess he was referring to before yeah. seven, seven, eight, nine, and I guess ten p.m. Well, this, this. Is, so I'm reading now the book by Lewis Raven Wallace, uh, who's trans who was fired from uh, uh, Marketplace, the public radio show, for having a viewpoint and said, okay, screw you. And then wrote a book called uh, The View from Nowhere. The View, I'm sorry, The View from Somewhere, um, which is a- a- talking about the need to get past this ideology of objectivity. And Wesley Lowry, the brilliant former Washington Post, and it's too bad he's former Washington Post now, 60 Minutes Quibi or whatever it is, brilliant, brilliant journalist who wrote a, an op-ed for the New York Times 
uh, echoing this idea that objectivity is a white box of big old white newsrooms. And it was up to the powerful old white people who decided what objectivity was and wasn't. So Lewis Raven Wallace's book, which as I say, I'm reading now, almost done with, is really, really good because he goes into the idea that, that if you are uh, trans, uh, if you are LGBTQ, if you, are, if you care about justice, you're not allowed to report on those areas because that's considered bias. What that means is you don't bring your lived experience to the reporting. Right. The reporting is poorer as a result. And, and so, no, objectivity is bullshit. Um, and, and I could well be put up against a wall at a journalism school tomorrow, but luckily we're not there, so I can't be. <laughs> um, uh, but, but I've long felt that it's, it's ridiculous. The standard in journalism is, is to be intellectually honest, is to, is to speak truth to power and truth to the public, to, to give un, uh, uncomfortable truths. Uh, we still need to do that. We need to be accurate. We need to be fair. We need to be all those things. But this idea of objectivity makes us somehow not quite human. Um, and that's ridiculous. Yeah, I love what you're saying. And I'm gonna, I, I'm not familiar with Lewis Raven Walls, and I'll have to get that book and maybe get him on the show or her on the show. What is he? What did you say? He's trans. He, he, trans. He, trans so, he, yeah. so Masha Gass, uh, Gassen, Gassen. Um, has this idea of of objectivity versus moral clarity. Have you, I don't know, did she come up with that? Have you th- heard uh, that well, kind I, of? I know, I know that Wesley Lowry talked about the exact same thing. What's the, what does that mean? Can you give me an example I, I, of a story? Yeah, the example is quite clear. If you say that something is racially tinged versus racist, if you say that someone in a passive voice uh, was killed versus police killed, that's the example that they, that they both give of moral clarity. Of having the linguistic honesty, it's 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 even it didn't even go to the point of morality to me. It's linguistic accuracy to say that uh, police killed Sally Jones, as opposed to saying uh, Sally Jones uh, died in a police-related incident. Got it. Right. Got it. Yeah. And, yeah, it makes a huge um, difference. Yeah, that's that's the that's the moral clarity here. And and the other moral clarity is is do we call, you know, can we not at this point downright outright call Donald Trump a liar? Yes, New York Times we can. Um that's moral clarity. That's just having the linguistic honesty to be straight with the public you serve. So going back to Joy Reid and MSNBC, I mean, there are you know, what a hundred some days left until the election. And like you said, it's really important for there to be a lot of good journalism, a lot of good media and broadcasting between now and then tonight, her debut show, she had both Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton on, uh, yeah, uh, which is a great a, book. Huh? Yeah. Pretty, uh, pretty big deal. Good for her. But one of the controversies of the day, Jeff, I don't know if you saw, but I want to get your take on it was that apparently, the the Biden campaign had reached out to the former Ohio governor, John Kasich, to maybe give him a speaking slot at the DNC at their whatever virtual convention. And uh, the left was pretty fired up about that, thinking it was wrong and it would backfire because, of course, John Kasich is very anti-abortion, anti-choice. And uh, I wonder if you had any thoughts on, on, on that, if you think that's even worth discussing, you and I, the John yeah, no, Kasich it, it invite. Is. I'm curious what you think first. I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna I, I, my, my initial first. reaction was uh, that John Kasich is wildly popular in Ohio and he's a mm-hmm. staunch Republican, no matter how you want to frame things. He is. He's a conservative guy and always has been pretty extreme, I think, on some things and very wrong on some things. But yep. but if he's going to bring Ohio along, you know, I'm I'm for it. I'm for a multi pronged approach at this. I don't like John Kasich. There's a lot of people, Jeff. You know, I don't like, but that doesn't mean I wouldn't invite them to the party if they're going to bring a good potato salad. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no salary, goddamn, no salary. Um, what? No salary? You're a monster. There's got to be. Some, now they're not invited. Salary got, and potato salad? No, you're, no, you're no, not. No, now no, clearly, no, you're no, not no, bringing no, a potato no, salad no. to my party. <laughs> uh, I agree with you. Uh, maybe because we're both old farts. Me, actually, old fart. You almost. Um, <laughs> I, I think that. 
Biden was almost going to get in trouble by trying to act as if he could somehow pull in right and left and be in the middle and all that BS. He has to go with the progressive agenda. He has to excite the left. He has to uh, have a bold uh, proposition on health care and infrastructure and employment and the issues that matter. At the same time, keeping two thoughts in the mind at the same time, there are sane Republicans left who have left Trump whom Kasich would speak to. And we don't have to agree with everything he says by putting him on the stage. We don't have to endorse everything he says. But if he is willing to go on stage as a Republican and say, I am endorsing a Democrat, I say, hallelujah. Right, right. And and right. And, and along with, uh, I saw also today George Will saying that he will be voting for Biden the first time he's ever voted for a Democrat. What do these kind of older, old fart Republicans uh, who have been Republicans and staunch conservatives their whole lives announcing that they're going to, to vote for Biden. Does it make a difference? I don't know, um, but I'll take any sign of sanity in the country. And, and, I, and I can't be in a position, this is again because I'm an old fart, I can't be in a position to say that because someone was wrong in the past, we're going to um, eliminate them. Great point. Uh, I've been wrong in the past. I've I've had wrong stances. That I've learned me. lessons. Oh yeah, I thought the Iraq War was not insane, and I was completely wrong. Oh wow. And yeah, yeah, I'll confess that. Um, I thought I thought it was a defense of the democracy of the people. Hmm. Right, I was wrong. Completely, absolutely, utterly. I'll say it wrong. Right. So I'm I'm there, having made a mistake in the past. Um, are you going to reject me forever? Maybe you will. Yeah, I think we should wrap this up. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, <laughs> based on it's your over. your your your, su- your support Sorry, for the Iraq Pete, War and and well, no support, support for salary. Strong uh, the salary is another problem here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I, Pete, I think we've got it. We've got to be in position. Uh, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that the way to win this election is big tent time. No, but but the way to win this election is to recognize the complete existential crisis this country is in. And if anyone is willing to uh, desert their own side to support sanity, I think we've got to um, at least, well, I was going to say shake their hand. We can't do that anymore. <laughs> at least, um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, give them a little salute and say thank you for the vote. Right. Okay. Next subject. Where are you, Jeff Jarvis, on secret police for or against? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> what are the pros uh, and cons of secret police? City to Trump, drop dead, coming to New York and Chicago. This is just awful. What scares me, Pete, is that I would have wished that the police of Portland would have stood up and said, get out of our turf. But I'm afraid they're not. I'm afraid that I would have wished that the military. So, 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 so let me just go over, go too far, which is what I do for a living. So that, that's why I'm here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm upset that people are asking even Trump, are you going to leave office if you lose? I think it's wrong to even ask him that. Why make that an option? Right. But it's in the discussion. So if Trump doesn't lose and, and Joe Biden said today, well, we know how to, to remove trespassers from, from government property. Well, that's the irony is that's exactly what the government says it's doing now. Is what we're going to have to do to Donald Trump. And who is our ally in this? Is it the military? Is it DHS? Is it local police? Um, what I think we're seeing going on in, in the entirety of society right now is that institutions that existed are being existentially challenged. Right. Uh, that includes journalism. It includes education. It includes policing. Right. So uh, it includes government. It includes everything uh, except radio, you know, because you're remaking it right now. I love it. And so I would have hoped that the police in Portland, Oregon would have said, if you get out of here, but apparently the union, they're not. So I get nervous about that. 
I get nervous about where the military is going to end up. Even though Donald Trump has insulted the military at every turn, what if they still stay with him? Do we end up in a position in this country where we have a coup? I, I don't want to go that far. I don't want to. I don't want to be sensationalistic and, and worry about that. But I just did right here on your air. Yeah. Um. Because I'm worried about that. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. It's a weird thing. Uh, how much he lies about what he's done for the military. And this interview with Chris Wallace, where he said, "You know, I've been the best president in the military." And and then in that same interview, I'm I'm pretty sure uh, he said, "I don't care what the military thinks." No, it doesn't. It doesn't. He did, yeah. right? I mean, I didn't even think yeah. he said yeah. that, but yeah. Yeah. do they yeah. not care that he yeah. thinks that? So, um, by the way, let's just, uh, I want to get your take on that. Why Do you think Chris Wallace deserves the type of credit that he is getting? No. And, you no. don't. It, was, it wasn't awful. It wasn't bad. He was better. Uh, he was okay. And they did fact check him and all that. But, but he still works for the devil, Rupert Murdoch. But let me con- confess something else here, my friend, because you are a friend of mine. I, I would like to think that. I love you. You're one of my favorite people. So uh, for the World Trade Center uh, fund thing, um, uh, because I was there that day, I went through a screening for health and psychological issues. And so I took the same test. Oh, the I cognitive the test. Uh, test. That's yeah. And I got a confession for you. I don't think I did that well. <laughs> uh, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. You can so, quote ace it. Uh, I didn't ace it. No, no, no. I did okay. I passed. They didn't. They didn't lock me up in Bellevue. It was literally, literally, literally. I took the test in Bellevue. Wow. <laughs> and so, so, but I freaked because because I was it was I was I was like on stage. So the thing that threw me, name as many words as you can to begin with the letter C. Okay, Pete, go. Cracker. Cuckold. Uh. <laughs> Christ, caring. Uh, I keep wanting to say cunt, but I should not. Uh, yeah. um, click. You're, you're doing better than I did, uh, right? Crush. I didn't do so well. Crazy. I didn't do so well. I, I did okay. I got enough. I somehow, my mind blanked. I could only think of proper names. Well, you asked and me while I was broadcasting on my show, so it's even well. harder. You but but, really well. but I don't well. I don't even but I don't like tests, period. Tests I, I think know, I suck. Them. But the the hundred minus seven, I did okay. The the other thing they do is they tell you five words and then they ask you a bunch of questions and you're supposed to remember the five words. And my response is I want to Google that. Yeah, that's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> you so, can't I don't think they allow so for that and the I did yeah, no, they don't, but we don't need our memory anymore. We have Google. Yeah, that's so true. Anyway, that's true. I did okay. I passed. They didn't lock me up in Bellevue, but I will have to confess to you, I didn't ace the test. And he didn't either, probably. Of course not. Of course not. Yeah, he probably knew the elephant. But um what was the question? They show a picture of an elephant and say, what is this or something? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, it is. It, I, mean, I, I did. I did pass the test. I was OK. They didn't say that I had kind of. But but, but I, I did kind of freak out because I thought, yeah, oh, well, the well, this. So anyway, Chris Wallace uh, also took the test. Said he did well. I want to see the results. But um, and he did all right in the interview, too. He was OK, but I wanted him to be more direct. But the problem is. And I said this on Twitter and somebody said, yeah, but Jeff, but at least Fox News people saw him being insane. But I don't think that's going to make any difference. Right. I think we're in this right. epistemological situation where people think, oh, Chris Wallace is his enemy. Fox now is his enemy. OAN is the only you know decent place. And of course, they're against him. And why give him trick questions like, is that an elephant? Someone was telling me that OAN is a real, like, I've never watched it, but I, oh. I guess I didn't realize. <laughs> what can you tell me? Are they, are they Q, they're QAnon-y-ish? Yeah, I, QAnon I, adjacent? I, I don't want to go in, I don't want to watch enough to figure out <laughs> the fine point of QAnon versus Russia. RT versus OAN mm-hmm. versus Fox. It's, it's, it's hard to tell, but yeah, they're all, they're all whack shit. So completely action. What do you think about? I mean, you, you you've been covering and talking about and following all things COVID nineteen as well as anybody on social media. And everybody should subscribe to your list, which I subscribe to, but I always forget what it's called. The COVID nineteen Twitter. If you go to if you go to bitly bit ly slash covid twitter list, you'll find six hundred experts, real experts. So 
What do you make of what has happened in the country since I guess we we last spoke, which is a couple of weeks? I mean, <laughs> it seems like the for us in New York, the peak, of course, was you know in April, and and that now we're we're you know safer. I don't want to say safe, but safer. Uh, but now you see what's happening in Florida and then Texas, Arizona, California again. And, and how do you, how do you explain what we are seeing based on the experts you follow? It's, it, they are frustrated. They're mortally frustrated because they all told us, they told us exactly what we needed to do. Mm-hmm. If we had shut down like Italy for two effing months, as a nation, as an entire nation. Yes, I'm sorry, Arkansas. I'm sorry, Florida. You're not as bad as New York now, but you will be. Everybody shuts down. Everybody wears masks. And in some fairness, we didn't know the full effectiveness of masks three months ago, but we learned as time went on. Everybody wear your damn masks. Um, don't go to rallies. Don't go to church. Don't be singing out loud. We know these things. We would be in the same state as Italy or Spain right or Germany right now. We'd be okay to the extent that we could spot an outbreak and deal with it. We are so far past that, so far out of the loop. Um, and, and the economy is going to be in terrible shape. We're still in wave one. Um, Floridians are coming to New York. I saw a car with Florida license plate last week and I wanted to the other day and I wanted to you know, <laughs> shoot it down with a howitzer. Um, yeah, I, right. right when you said that, I was like, oh my God, I think I'd be crazy if I saw oh, yeah. a car okay, with Florida plates no, oh, in here. the neighborhood. Get out of here. Yikes. Um, so uh, we're screwed. We're completely, utterly screwed. And our our smart mayor here in New Jersey, mayor, governor here in New Jersey, Governor Murphy, just, uh, my wife tells me, just said that uh, every student and parent and school has the right to at-home education in the fall because we know where this is going to go. And you know, I went out today. I don't, I'm curious to hear what you've done. So, so far I've had to go, I've had my hair cut once. Mm. Uh, I've oh, gone that's where, that's where you times. start. That's where you start with me. The that's hair. Where I start. No, you did. I've had, I've had, uh, well, of course I have hair, so I'm lucky. No, I see what Unlike you, you. Yeah. Um, I've been to the drugstore three times. My wife won't let me go to the food store because what, what takes her 40 minutes would take me 45 hours. Um, and I've been to the post office three times. That's it. Today, mm. for the first time, I went to my favorite used bookstore in Morristown, New Jersey, with one other customer. That's all I have done in the last mm. four months. How about you? What have you done? Well, my situation is is that, you know, I have daughters who are 12 and 15. And a wife who's not really on the same page with me in terms of being as vigilant and conservative about it. So what, like a lot of people listening and a lot of people across this country, it, it lends itself to real problems in in your in your family when you're not quite on the same page. It's not like my family's your wife is more um, optimistic. Yeah, that would be a word. I would I would argue maybe a little bit in denial, but you know, she'll, her argument will be we're in phase four. We're in phase four. I mean, oh, we have no, not no, gone no, 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 out no, to no, dinner. My wife, my wife is no, no. We have no, no. We haven't done. We we now we now three times have done takeout pizza, but no takeout food. How about you? Oh yeah, plenty of takeout. Food. Listen, no, we we're we way, we've done. They more than I have done it. My daughter went to uh, Long Beach Island twice and stayed Ooh. in a hotel. Ooh. And my wife stay, uh, went with them this past weekend. I had these two guys over to my house helping me with the studio mm-hmm. build over mm-hmm. the weekend. We were in close quarters, mostly yeah. without masks. Um, one of which, oh. you know, this guy's 63. I'm, I'm a lot more concerned about how much of the insulation he inhaled than COVID-19 for his case. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, so we've been, I don't know what the word would be, but. Um, At risk. We've been, yeah, we've been taking risks. I mean, I yeah. look at I look at it and say, I mean, how do you look at it? I look at it and say, I look at the numbers. And I was like, well, there haven't been any hospitalizations or deaths. The cases are very, very low. And when I go out in public, I wear a mask. I should be OK. I mean, I obviously I wash my hands. I wear the a mask. How is it takes one super spreader? I, I, I just last week I turned 60 fucking six years old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've had two cancers. I have a heart condition, lung condition. Um, right. So I'm, I'm high. That puts you in a different category. 
I'm a, you're, yeah, see, I'm, I am an official old fart. You're becoming yeah, an no, old No, I fart. just have ear hair. That's my only <laughs> vulnerability right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if so, the virus so, clings to it. Right. And so I, it takes one bad move. Right. And that's where we are. And so it's not about how the whole society is doing. This is, this is, this fascinates me because it, it goes to um, prostate testing and breast cancer testing. Because, because the statistical view is, ah, oh, let's not test so much. It finds uh, things it shouldn't find. Uh, it doesn't save that many lives. Screw it. Well, having had prostate cancer, um, which was fairly fast moving, if I hadn't been tested individually, I'd be probably suffering right now, hmm. right? Um, so the collective statistical view is fools us. At an individual view, all it takes is your one prostate or your one super spreader right. to screw you. And that's where we are still now. And it's really hard to get down from the collective view, the statistical view, the view that they show on TV all the time, to the view that, no, one bad ass sneezes on you, you could die. I think that's a fine way of looking at it. I have no problem with it. Like I said, I'm on the more conservative end of it. Uh, and so you're staying in the shed. You are. You yeah, are, you I'm are. trying to. I mean, you know, do you know where I go to a lot is the hardware store. I mean, that's where I end up going oh, to a lot for things. Oh, but those, are, those have to be a bunch of assholes who don't wear masks. Everybody's wearing Macho. a mask. I, if, I, 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 if I saw someone without a mask, I would not forget that person. Would you scold them? Yes. Do you, have you scolded anybody? No, I haven't seen anybody. I saw a guy without oh. a mask in the gas station, which I was in for one minute. And he and uh, as I was about to say something, I realized he was asking the gas station attendant for the bathroom key. And I was just like, he's in and out. He's gone before I even could. But that's the literally the only person I've seen in public. So, not so wearing a mask. So I was in the public yep. office today mm-hmm. and the guy he's behind a plastic you know, curtain there. Um, his mask was down below his mouth and nose. Should I have scolded him? Should I have said, sir, could you put that up? Yeah. I, I just don't know. I I'm just don't. Shit. Well, I'm I don't chicken. know if it's about, I don't see, I don't know if it's effective necessarily. You, it's these things backfire. Like, you know what I've been doing for years and, and I'm pretty sure it's never been effective and never worked is I've been telling uh, people behind cash registers not to give plastic bags when they were still a thing. Oh, and you're I, obnoxious. Well, see, that's what you say, but what's the difference? I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's never worked. I, I think I am obnoxious, and I've tried it many different ways, but I don't think it's ever, ever worked. It's a virtue signaling liberal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Um, let me ask you this. The Trump administration news today is uh, trying to block funding for coronavirus testing and contact tracing. How fucking evil can they be? That's the, they wake up every single morning and say, what new could we do that would be really evil? I just don't understand this. I don't understand. I really don't. I really don't. What's uh, well, that? I, I guess I finally figured out this extent. So Trump's golf strategy is obviously if you don't keep score, you win. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. And so that or, or, or if he in, you, if he keeps score, he wins. He wins. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, but good Lord, the, the only thing that is going to get us out of this mess and get us back to an economy is if we have huge testing at scale. If all of us can test at least once a week, if we can test in certain circumstances, right? When I go to get my hair cut, I know that the guy who's cutting my hair has gotten tested within three days. I get tested before I get my hair cut, whatever. Right, we come, we're going to have a whole new societal norm for this. That is the only thing that is going to get us out of this. Wear the masks, get tested. Uh, it's been the same from the very beginning. I can't even remember now. It's 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 test, trace, and isolate. Right, that was the that's always been the formula. So this is brilliant. Well, in my in my list, but Bitly slash COVID mm-hmm. Twitter list. One of the people I admire immensely is named Debbie Sridhar, who's a woman, an American woman who is in Scotland. And she scolded the hell out of Scotland and kept them in line and pushed them and pushed them and pushed them far better than, than England, uh, than Britain. And uh, they're, they've been down to zero deaths for, for days upon days. They can get back to a normal life. 
they can do things right because they because enough people listened in in in, in power to make it happen. And so we have to have testing. We have to have tracing. Without that, we are doomed. We'll be at hundreds of thousands of deaths. The economy will be in shambles. Uh, we'll have missed an entire year of school. Um, entire industries will shut down. The airline industry and the restaurant industry will be doomed, and 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 retail will all be doomed. Um, we're screwed. And so the, the the question then is, can we wait till January? If God help us, I'm knocking wood right now. I ask you to as well, everyone listening. Um, that Joe Biden gets in, uh, how long does it take him to be able to ramp up? Um, yeah, that's a re- that's a really good question. But I thought what you were going to say earlier with you know is is when you said the only thing that works is is massive you know scaled up testing and tracing. But I thought you were going to say the only thing that will work is if uh, the election. Joe Biden wins and he takes well, office and I'm, Trump I'm, steps I'm, down I'm because yes. yeah, because there's we're not going to see anything from this administration or no. apparently his CDC or or any no. of the, no. you know, the no. task force, I guess, which was back today. Did they do that today? Did they have a thing? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't see anything. No. Um, but, but even even if even if here's the problem, you have Kemp in Georgia. That's all you need to know. Kemp is going after the mayor of Atlanta. Stopping her from having people wearing masks, uh, suing her, and then trying to stop her First Amendment rights to speak. This is who you elected, Georgia. Congratulations. Yeah, it's 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 so that so you're saying not only you know at the federal level, but uh, at the state level, which is where so many of these it should happen at the federal level, right? Every one of right. any sense says there should be a nationwide mask order. There should have been a nationwide shutdown. He should have brought in every possible resource to get testing and tracing going. None of that's going to happen. None of it. How closely are you following the Jeffrey Epstein, Bill Barr, Donald Trump dots? I am so anti-conspiracy theory. There are none that I believe in. Last night, uh, a federal judge was uh, her, her husband was brutally uh, shot and her yes. son was brutally murdered by a guy turns out was an attorney a- in her courtroom at, at some point and was pr- it seems like he was disgruntled he later that night last night killed him took his own life killed himself shot himself the point is th- these conspiracy theories the, the bizarre thing is that they go after the clintons and not trump but the these this connection between bill barr and jeffrey epstein and donald trump do you see anything there do you follow that at all jeff we can move no. on if you don't my my general belief is that nobody is well organized enough to conspire. Right. You know, I, I work that's mine too. Companies, same. Right. Same. So I tend to believe the same thing. My my wife will look at Twitter and kind of say, well, but, and you know, you, you follow some of the folks on Twitter and, and you start to wonder and you do see, you know, you start to get into Deutsche Bank and Trump and Epstein and, you know, I'm not a trilateral commission kind of guy. I don't think that the world gets run that way. Nonetheless, there are bad guys who do connect. And so, yeah, Deutsche Bank could be at the network of of these bad guys doing bad things and laundering their money and doing all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, it's possible. But life is screwed up enough even without the conspiracy. You don't have to believe in the conspiracy theories to say that um, we're, we have utterly, completely morally failed with the coronavirus. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty, what could be more obvious than that? So given the, the state of things and the state of, you know, the campaign with about a hundred days left, I mean, you've been tweeting about this and obviously thinking about this. How, how do you see things going for the election at, at this point where we're at Joe Biden, Basically, strategy hunkering down, let Trump uh, destroy himself is is what seems to be uh, the strategy. And I support it seems to be working. Yes, but so in the last election, last presidential election, I I volunteered for Hillary Clinton and Bethlehem, PA. And the first week I went to 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 register voters, I was outside the public library and I saw a Clinton voter pass. I said, thank you very much, ma'am. And then two Trump voters, and then two Clinton voters, and then four Trump voters, and I realized we're screwed. And in that election, the polls were showing Clinton winning 
because I think that there was a certain amount of Trump shame. So my fear in this election is the Trump shame, the unwillingness to admit to a pollster that you're going to vote for Trump is 10 times greater. So that the polls are showing now these huge numbers for Biden. God's sakes, people don't believe them. Get everybody you can out to vote because, because I think that we, we've been there before and we could be there again all too easily. I'm scared. I'm right. still scared. I'm right. not predicting anything. I think, I think that journalistically, prediction is worthless. We're always wrong. It doesn't inform the voters. I also think that polls are dangerous. There was a great Columbia professor named James Carey who said that polls preempt the conversation they're meant to inform. And, and I don't think polls really tell us what's going on at all. I think people are, are screwing around with the pollsters and mind-fucking them. And so I want to stay scared. I think we have to stay scared. Yes, I agree. I don't know. I, I do agree. not know what's going to happen. It's hard to be scared every day. It is. It is. Uh, but, you know, on the other hand, you're in your he shed. I'm in my Almost. lovely office at home where I got from Rate My Skype Room a 10 out of 10. I'm very proud to No, say. when did this happen? I didn't see that. What did you 10, change? Ten, nothing, nothing. I just stayed 10. I started and ended at 10 out of 10. I'm, it so is I'm beautiful. comfortable. Yeah. I'm very comfortable. I'm very privileged. I'm very lucky. I'm talking to my colleagues. You know, one of my colleagues who I got, I moved here from, from Europe is in a one bedroom apartment in Brooklyn, which seemed really cool until they can't leave. Mm, right. And, 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 and various of my New York colleagues now are talking about New Jersey's not so bad. Maybe right. they'll move to the suburbs, right? Oh, here in the suburbs. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we're okay. Right. We're okay. We're, we're pretty privileged. We're in good shape. No doubt. I'm living an okay life right now. I'm trying to write the book. I'm talking to you. I'm, I'm lucky. I'm very lucky. Um, but I'm scared to death. Well, you have uh, a great, November. I like the way you gave a good nuanced perspective of it. That's perfect. What is your, did I know you were writing a book? What is your book about? Well, no, I haven't shown it. I haven't had the courage yet to show it any publishers. I'm trying to see if I can write it now. It's, it's the end of the Gutenberg age. Oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I can, I can, I can bore you for a long time with, with trivial knowledge about, about early printing. I don't, don't think. Don't get me started. I don't think you can bore me. I really don't oh, think you can. Oh, I could. You I can could. try. Did you know? We should Did do a whole know? podcast where you try to bore me. Try I'm to not bore sure you. that you can. Can I bore? I don't think you <laughs> so can. So did you know that for a time, various nations saw rags as a strategic national resource? Because paper was made from rags until the 1840s when it was finally made from wood pulp. So, so there, were, there were ads in newspapers saying, ladies, it was always ladies, save your rags, save your underwear, save your napkins, save everything. It's a national resource. We need this for paper so we can have speech on paper. And, rags. and well, first of all, A, that's interesting. But if that were today, half the country would say it's a hoax. Paper's not made yeah. of rags. It's a hoax. <sighs> yes, yes, exactly. I wonder if I'm we ever burn my rags. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if we ever get to um, any kind of you, you, united we stand, any kind of unity in this country. Because and I and I blame the media more than anything else, and and the way that it works, and and, and so on. But I, I I feel like we're always going to be as divided as we are now, if if not if not more. I, I I'm an optimistic, positive guy, but I have such a hard time given. Hannity and Tucker Carlson and their popularity and their support and thinking that that it's going to change at least anytime soon. I earlier quoted James Carey, the late Columbia professor who I admire greatly, who said mm -hmm. that democracies are conversations, preferably or republics are conversations, republicly cacophonous conversations. Oh. What's happening right now is that we are not accustomed to the cacophony of democracy. We are hearing voices. We don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to speak. We don't know how to listen. We're relearning how to hold a conversation with ourselves. And it's going to take time. It was in the control of, in the Gutenberg age, it was, see, I'm, I'm doing the book right now. It was in the control of big old media. And now, you know, this is, this is the whole thing. This is a conversation we should have at length, but not now, obviously, because we're at the end of our time, but um, about cancel culture, Right. I realized the other day that what's happened recently is that the whole discussion about content moderation, 
you can't say that. Ah, you people, Facebook should kill that. And then the other side says, you just killed my hate speech. How dare you? Right? And that was all within the fence of Facebook. Now it has gone out to the rest of the culture. And now the same thing is happening at the New York Times and New York Magazine and everywhere where this, 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 we're, we're trying to renegotiate our norms for speech. And the difference is that there are people now we can hear we never could hear before. Right. And it's cacophonous. And it's difficult, but we'll figure it out. We're not idiots in the long run. In the short run, we're idiots. But in the long run, no, I'm an optimist like you. Oh, I appreciate that. I'm glad that you're uh, you're saying that. What did you think of Barry Weiss's resignation and all of uh, that? I, what did you think? I don't know what to think. I think the whole thing's ridiculous. Yeah. When yeah. you have a column in the New York Times and you're saying no one wants to, no one will let me speak. You're in the New York Times. What are you talking about? Like, exactly. That, that whole thing doesn't make... The, the, the lot of the, uh, letter was ridiculous and I thought the response letter was better. But the Harper the problem with the Harper's letter was that there were no links in it. It was it was mm. pure moral panic. Yeah, I didn't read it. I gotta I gotta go back and read. It. I know like Chomsky signed it and other people who I who I admired Ugh. and respect to some extent, uh, I think, signed it and I was I was surprised by some of the names on that. But it seems like all of the people that are complaining about being canceled or cancel culture are white people. It seems overwhelming. Amen. Amen. They're privileged. Yep. Yeah, it's a, I don't know. That seems pretty obvious to me. All right. Well, I love you, my father. I, I love Jeff you, Jarvis, the greatest. If, if if we could, we'd hug right now, but that would be a wrong thing. We to will. Do, even if we could, we will in the future. We'll in, we'll, in a future day. In a beautiful day, we can walk through the daisies. I will. We'll walk through the daisies, and in my right hand, I will have um the, the your favorite bottle of red wine, and in my left hand, I will have either your hand or a potato salad without <laughs> celery. <laughs> I'll bring the celery for you, but you have to put it in yourself because it's wrong. It's wrong to have celery and potato salad. How could you dare? I don't know how or who raised you. Where are you on mayonnaise? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm white. But here's the problem. <laughs> here's the problem. We don't just we we really white people. We don't just have mayonnaise. We have Miracle Whip. Well, I wow. You just added yourself. I think mayonnaise is an American thing more than a white thing. I feel like it's Europeans think it's crazy, you, but. Well, Europeans make mayonnaise. They do they? French do the eggs and everything. Is that right? Yeah. The, the, so, so, so when I grew up, tuna salad was can of tuna and Miracle Whip and mm. chopped up pickles. They had tuna and pickles when you were young. Oh, you're cruel. You're Weren't cruel. they still cucumber? <laughs> you're cruel. I'm surprised you could hear with all the hair in your ears. Oh, he fires back and it hurts because it's from him. You're the greatest. Thank you, Jeff Jarvis. You are the greatest, sir. I am honored to be your friend. Thank you. You're the greatest. All right, buddy. And hey, everybody, give to him on Patreon. Listen oh, to me. I'm so glad I didn't press stop yet. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. There he goes, Jeff Jarvis at Jeff Jarvis on Twitter, buzzmachine.com. Check him out at the Craig Newmark School of Journalism in New York City. Oh, I love that guy. And thanks for the plugs, Jeff, as always. I'll try to, well, I was going to say, I'll try to get the video out, but I, I couldn't because I've got all kinds of technical problems for a short amount of time. The shed is, the shed studio, the shedio, the she shed, whatever you want to call it, is coming together. And I'm very excited about that and not having to deal with technical issues anymore, hopefully. Okay, so joining me next is my friend Cambry Cruz, who I talked to a little bit about earlier. Cambry is a storyteller. She's based out of New York City. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Burn Down the Ground, a memoir, a book about her chaotic childhood with her deaf parents. And she sadly passed. Uh, she sadly passed. She he sadly lost her dad last week. And shortly after, she tweeted at Cambry at K-A-M-B-R-I. She said, I'm sad to report. My dad did not live to see the free world. Granted parole on June 11th, he died 30 days later in the Texas Department of Correctional, what does J stand for? TDCJ Hospital. So, my dear friend and greatest teacher gave me a lesson on how to say goodbye. Due to COVID being on the rise in Texas, he was not allowed visitors. She lost her dad, and he was still in prison, even though he'd been paroled. And she had to say goodbye to him like so many other people do now on FaceTime. Horrible, but she tells this story. It's inspiring, it's enlightening, and identifies a major problem with incarceration in America today. We had to switch from Zoom to the phone because of little technical issues, so the quality 
some minor quality change. I don't think you'll notice it. Here now is my conversation with the very inspiring Cambry Cruz. No relation to Terry or Tom. Well, I think you're the best. I'm a huge fan of you. Always have been, but now more than ever. I'm so sorry for your loss. Yeah, I'm just I'm still in shock. I really am. I mean, I I honestly there was a part of me that always thought he was going to die in jail. And then as we got close to the end, it never occurred to me anymore that he he looked so fit and trim. He had a lot of major dental problems and that was leading to some malnourishment and at the end, some starvation Mm. Um, and because he couldn't like chew food or couldn't chew, couldn't chew the food that they were providing too. because of COVID they went into lockdown and started providing them with Johnny sacks, which is like a lingo for sack lunches essentially. And the sack lunches were subpar to say the best about them. They were um, not enough calories for grown men. There were a lot of them had moldy bread, meat that was still frozen, hard peanut butter. So not digestible for uh, most, most of the men. Yeah. So I started recording like two minutes ago. Um, what, what, uh, prison was your father in? Uh, my dad was in the Texas department of criminal justice, Estelle unit. I think the official name of it is the WJ Estelle unit named for a man whose last name is Estelle. E S T E L L E. Uh, in Huntsville, in Huntsville. How Texas. long was he in that? Uh, for the m- most of his sentence, he had been sentenced to 20 years. And then in when you're first sentenced to prison, you go through a battery of testing to figure out where you're best placed. I do think that they, you know, I don't know if they they consider location of family and things like that when they're trying to find your permanent placement but he was permanently placed in Estelle. That is where they have a lot of deaf inmates, but not all of the deaf inmates go there because my father was deaf and born that way. Your father was sentenced uh, to prison for attempted murder. Is that what the charge was? Yeah, the actual charge is aggravated assault. And, you know, I've always said my dad deserved jail time. He deserved punishment. He deserved some time away from society. Society needed to be protected from him. He needed to be protected from the world and all the the different, the chaos of it. He needed the institution to help him go from, uh, have a better day-to-day life. And he needed some counseling and and rehabilitation. And unfortunately that's just not, uh, I was very naive in thinking, Oh, maybe he'll now get uh, some drug and rehab, uh, alcohol rehabilitation. Maybe he'll get some domestic violence training. And it, it's, that's just not true. I understand why you say, you know, he needed to be uh, put away from people or people needed to be protected from him because he was threatening and he was, he was, he was violent. But do you really think that he needed in retrospect, when you look at it, when you look at our, criminal justice system does does punishment and consequences do you think that made a difference that part of it yeah i I, i've given speeches on this that their prison is supposed to be a three-pronged uh service i guess for the community you're supposed to you, you did something wrong you should serve some time or uh community service whatever punishment looks like for the the crime that you did and who you are that you should be punished Uh, It's to protect society and then it's to rehabilitate. And that's that third rehabilitation that doesn't happen. And then when it comes to punishment, unfortunately, we have a very limited view of what that is. And that's what I think the the current movement to uh, reform prison is talking about restorative justice. And um, it, it, it doesn't look the same for everyone. And when my dad first went in, it looked like what you, it should have. It, it was behind bars, stripped of all his rights. He needed to detox from his anger, essentially. You know, he, he needed a chance to, to be, have his rights taken away for a while. And, um, you know, he had done a, a very violent crime and it wasn't the first time. And I do think that it served its purpose, but that purpose had run out a long time ago. You strike me as always 
have seeming really honest and, and open and vulnerable about, vulnerable about it all. Were you ever embarrassed or ashamed to talk about your dad? Oh my God. So embarrassed. embarrassed. Yeah. Yeah. So when my dad first, um, revealed this dark side of himself to me, which was in the form of an attack on my mom. It was the uh, summer before I turned, or the summer I turned 17. It was before my senior year in high school. And I had never witnessed him being violent or anything. And he attacked my mom. And I was there, witnessed the attack, intervened, called the police. But this was 1988, you know, before the domestic violence laws were different. Uh, It was before no Nicole Brown Simpson. Mm. So he just got a couple of years probation. Um, my mom didn't um, help press charges, I guess. She didn't cooperate with authorities. And for a long time, that really upset me. I was very angry by it, thought she was weak and stupid for it. And now in retrospect, I understand so many different reasons why um, that she wouldn't want him to go to jail and uh, both as a victim and as a a mom and as a, a, a going through a divorce with him. And there's so many reasons, but, um, that, that attack, you know, it was so, it disrupted my life so dramatically turned my whole life upside down. I had was about to graduate summa cum laude and I had, a really bright future ahead of me, but I didn't have any family support anymore. And not that my family's support was ever that great, but now it was obliterated. Mm. And so I, instead of going to college, I ended up getting married at 17 and the man I married was uh, in the Navy. And when he got out of the Navy, we moved to Akron, which is where he was from Ohio and taking his last name and moving across the country was like, uh, what I called a homespun witness protection program because <laughs> it was the days before the internet, you know, no one could find me. And I did not tell a soul. Like I did not tell them. I told people that my family was deaf because that was the more interesting and exciting part of my life. But I certainly didn't tell them how poor I'd grown up living in a tin shed without running water, having a trailer repossessed and all the trauma and my my brother was mentally ill and struggling struggling with that and and then of course this attack on my mom I, I didn't talk about any of that but as a result of not talking about it i had terrible nightmares um that were recurring and they were almost verbatim every time i would have them wow. they were two different types one was where i was um, I had killed someone or done some sort of accidental or purposeful crime, and the police were now on to me, like they were closing in. And a lot of it, usually the dreams included some body or evidence being hidden under the baseboards. And it was very graphic and very violent and very scary. And that was one recurring dream. And then the second one was where it was more like a Friday the 13th type scenario where everyone around me is getting attacked and killed and I'm the sole survivor on oh, the run. Cambry. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. That's horrible. Both of, you know, and the, they're terrible, terrible dreams. And, and it's clear that I was just suffering from post-traumatic tre- stress and, and then also carrying around so much shame and so much guilt right. and living a facade of who I was. I was um, at the time working in a bank in Ohio I started working as a teller when I was 18 Hmm. and I'd worked my way up through the bank and somehow without college became an assistant vice president of this bank by the time I was 25. Wow. Uh, Yeah. Foreclosing on um, half million million dollar commercial loans and repossessing commercial real estate, flipping it, property management, like major stuff, not, not easy stuff, doing a lot of loan workouts and, um, really important and stuff. I, I, I look back on that and I'm like, how on earth did I do that? But I was really <laughs> good at it. <laughs> I was really good at it. I certainly didn't want to be a banker when I grew up, but yeah. Do you think though that, I mean, I'm just psychoanalyzing the whole situation that because you, you hid the truth about your, your past and your family, it came out in your dreams. And are you oh, saying yeah. that you came to this I mean, what, what brought you to the point where you became so open about it? Because I admire you so much for talking about it. And I think it's 
all of us need to be able to talk about these things more openly, especially 100%. the type of situation. But what 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 was it that gave you permission to feel comfortable to talk about it without that shame anymore? Um, it was uh, coming to New York. I moved to New York in two, uh, 2000, officially in the year 2000. I had uh, sort of dipped my toes into living in New York in 99. I was kind of going back and forth. You know how you like sleep on couches and visit yeah. friends or you go as a tourist or whatever. I'd been coming to New York City as a tourist since like 96 or so. Um, but finally in 2000, I quit my banking job, moved across the country, threw everything in the back of my cabrio, and here I was. And uh, when I met Christian, my now my husband, that first marriage not lasting, like when you get married at 17, like really doesn't no one really expects it to last. But every now and then somebody will hear that I got divorced and they're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, no, yeah. He, he's, he's still a good guy. I still love him. But no, uh, we were children. And um, so but w when I met Christian and I started getting involved in the comedy community. Yeah. I started hearing people talking about their lives and joking about their lives. And none of it was as complicated as my life, of course, but some of it was, you know, and a lot of frank discussion about drug and alcohol addiction or weight and relationships and, you know, the usual stuff. Well, any, yeah, of comedians, stuff. comedians seem to uh, compete to tell their truths, no matter how horrible they yeah. might seem. And, and I, I know I, I don't make want to make this about me, but I always felt like, well, I'll never be a, a, a great comic because I had a pretty good life. I don't have anything to <laughs> to mine, but I know what you're saying. So you, you be, right. being around all these people telling their truths make, made you feel like you had permission to tell yours. Is that what you're saying? One hundred percent. And mm. then also because Christian is not keen on talking too much about his personal life. I mean, he talks about his personal life on stage, but like his real, real personal life, some tragedies in his life, he was never really very open about. Mm -hmm. And anytime we are at a party, he would always kind of pull me out as a parlor trick kind of uh, little secret weapon to get the conversation turned off of him. Just because he was socially awkward and uncomfortable about being the center of attention, which sounds crazy considering he's a comedian, but just off stage would rather not be talking about himself. And so if the, we were ever meeting people at a party, yeah, I was his favorite parlor trick where he'd be like, wait, till, you think this is interesting? Wait till you get a load of her story. And, you know, then it would be like my turn to say, yeah, I, I lived in a tin shed, no running water. My whole family's deaf. My dad tried to kill my mother, and now he's in prison for trying to kill another woman. And people's eyes would bug out of their heads, you know, like, what? You've got to write a book. Um, but And the, you that, did. It's called Burn Down the Ground, everybody. <laughs> yeah. In 2012, go buy it 12, now. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So that's uh, – and then I – at the same time, I had created a little performance space called Ochi's Lounge in the basement of comics, which uh, – rest in peace comics was in the meatpacking yeah, district. Yeah, I remember it was a very, It was a big deal. Very, it was a big deal. It was a very exciting time to be in the meatpacking district and in New York in general. It was fresh off, you know, the sex in the city kind of years of uh, glamour and high – Fancy to live in, I guess, but uh, the meatpacking district is where that was. And Ochi's Lounge was a teeny little space, and it really gave me permission to hop up there and just work through some stuff because it, right. it was one of those quote unquote alternative venues where you can just tell a story that's not not fully formed and you've got your notes with you, and it's where you're supposed to work that kind of stuff out. And I did. And from there, I got a book deal. And then after the book came out, that's when I really made the rounds telling my story and right. connecting with people. And, so and what, I'm so glad I did. Yeah, so, so are we. And and so what? how did your relationship with your father change while he was in prison? What was your uh, communication like? What was the quality? What was the actual type of communication? How frequent was it? And how did your relationship change as a result of you being honest and coming to terms with your past publicly as well. Well, when he first went to prison, I grieved as though I'd lost him, as though he had died. It was uh, 2002, summer 2002. I'd just turned 31, and it was right after 9-11, 
and I worked in Rockefeller Center at the time of 9-11 and all the anthrax attacks had just happened. And, you know, Tom Brokaw had gotten anthrax and, and we shared the same post office in Rockefeller Center. So it was like a really stressful, awful, tragic time to be working in the city and living in the city. And, but we were kind of coming back from it, you know, it was like the country had come together and we were rebuilding and, um, the terrorism threats had kind of subsided a little. And, and then my dad tried to kill this woman and it was as if my subconscious had gotten a really stiff jolt of smelling salts, you know, my whole body, all my, my inner life was suddenly very much alive and back. All those bad dreams that I used to have came back. It was really traumatic. And I grieved for him as though he died. I thought at 55, a 20 year sentence, he's going to die in prison. You know, he's, right. he's going to die. And the, the man I was working with at the time at this law firm in Rockefeller Center, the day my dad got sentenced, he kind of whisked me out of the office and just took me to Cipriani on uh, 6th Avenue and 49th Street and ordered me a tuna steak. I'd never had tuna steak before. And he's like, uh, it's not like tuna like you're thinking. It's like a steak, but it's different. You'll like it. <laughs> you know? It was like $30. I was like, oh, my God. He goes, don't worry. I got it. Um, and he was just really he, – he, he comforted me in, in his very brusque Brooklyn – New York way, you know, by just whisking me out of there and buying me this really fancy lunch, just the two of us and letting me just kind of brood over my, my tuna steak, which I did like. I (laughs) I still don't think (laughs) I've had one. It's really good. But he, uh, I was like, my dad's 55. He's going to die in jail. And he's like, well, he's not dead yet. And at least you know where to find him. And that really like click snapped me out of it. Wow. It, totally snapped me out of it. You you know what? He's right. I know where to find him. He's not going to be able to hurt anyone. He can get sober. He can, he can be, um, his, he was so institutionalized as a kid, you know, living in a deaf school, they had told him when to eat, when to go to sleep, when to go to class, when to go to lunch, when to go to bed, everything, every bit of his life had always been regimented from the time he went to deaf school at four years old till he graduated at 19. So I felt like, well, you know what, in an institution where he's used to these rules, maybe he'll thrive. And he did in a lot of ways. And not in, in his early years there, he was struggling, you know, to find that pecking order and bucking against the system and everything. But I wrote to him. I wrote to him faithfully because he was deaf. We weren't able to have phone calls. Right. They have a video relay service, but that is me talking to a human over the phone like you and I are now. That human video uh, conferencing with my father who she, she or he can see my dad. And so that inter- interpreter signs what I just said. My dad then signs back to this interpreter who then vocally tells me what he said. So it's already the telephone game. It's a little clunky. Right. The video would always freeze up. It, you're talking to a stranger. I'm just, I, and you're talking to them as though you're talking to your dad. So it'd be like, if Pete, you're my interpreter, I'd be like, hi, dad, how are you? Right. And, got it. And then I wait. Yeah. It's really weird. Uh, you get used to it, but still it wasn't ideal. He, yeah. He you, it's I hard to have letters. an intimate conversation with a middle yeah. man or a woman. So what, what yeah. did, the, did the letter writing, um, what, what were the letters like? What were his letters like? What were your letters like? Were they, were they mundane or were they detailed no. and uh, detailed, detailed? We share everything. We uh, talked in great length about everything. Mm. And um, there were times when he would get on my nerves and it comes, it becomes very clear in my letters. At some points he told me I was acting like his mother and not his daughter. And so he sent me a Mother's Day card. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> funny. I, yeah, because I gave him an allowance and I was always scolding him about following the rules and things like that. And um, But he would just... Uh, every now and then would just kind of go overboard on the demands of my time. Hmm. Like, I need you to research this. I need you to get this, call this. You didn't do this. I'm like, dad, I have a husband. I have a dog. I have an apartment. I have a business. I, you know, I have a life and I'm not your personal assistant. And then 
uh, he would kind of back off and then it would kind of increase again. And I'd have to remind him, dad, you're doing it again. What, but um, what was he what was he trying to do while in prison? What were his goals? How was he developing? Was he trying to get out? Yeah, he for a long time declared his innocence. He was not guilty of attempted murder or aggravated assault. He had not tried to kill this woman. He she was trying to kill herself. He was trying to stop it. And in the meantime, she got stabbed a few times. And it was not plausible. I didn't believe it, but he couldn't seem to shake free from this lie. And with my dad, it's like he told a lie so many times it became his truth. Oh, that's very common. I think I've done that. I think I've done that about things that I'm not even sure that it's a lie. So maybe it's a little different, but sometimes I'll, I'll be telling a story and someone, you know, a friend or family member is like, that's not what happened. So that's, that's not that uncommon, but yeah. So go ahead. But this is obviously a much more severe there. And also there's witnesses and evidence, you know, (laughs) but, um, That said, he was also a blackout drunk. And so I do think that when he attacked my mom, anytime he was violent with my mom, which, by the way, he was never, ever violent with me or my brother. Never once. One time he spanked me and I had seen an episode of Little Rascals where Spanky put a book in his britches when he was about to get spanked. So my dad said, you know, he's going to spank me. I ran and grabbed the closest book I could find. And it was like a three inch thick pocket sized Bible (laughs) that I stuck in my pants. And you could totally see this big bulging outline. And so and, and that and my dad whipped me, but he was trying to like stifle a laugh. That's the level of violence I had ever had. The symbol, the symbolism that it's a Bible. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So, I know. I felt very blasphemous too, even though I was, I, very, I was like eight. <laughs> at what point did you? At what point did your dad become a an advocate for inmates' rights? Very early on, because as a deaf inmate, he was very frustrated by the lack of um, basic equipment to to make their day to day not lives not easier per se, but to avoid punishment and penalty and retribution for for innocent mistakes or just miscommunication. For example, they would sometimes miss chow because they didn't hear the bell or the sound or the alarm. And so and then you wouldn't be allowed to eat until the next day. So you go for a long stretch of time with missing this meal. So he designed this little prototype box that was very easy, simple light system that for chow time, it would light red or, you know, when it was time to be counted, Mm. he had a whole different pattern of lights for it. And he drew up this prototype and he wrote letters to the National Association of the Deaf and just the, the number of legal filings that he wrote that went unanswered was extraordinarily frustrating for Mm. him. He's like, nobody cares about us in here. And I, and I said, well, uh, you have to understand that a lot of these deaf organizations are charitable and they're run by volunteers. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, but inmates are on the bottom of the yeah. list of, of priorities. I, it is sad, but it is true. And, and you're right. But um, it didn't make him stop. Um, but he there there is actually a report about um abuse in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice that highlights his particular unit as being one of the most egregious that has the most rapes uh, against um, inmates, mostly perpetrated by guards. Uh, The the abuse by the disabled, the blind and the deaf in particular, was pretty abhorrent there. And it it's a it's an official report like this isn't hyperbole this isn't conjecture this isn't um just stories you know it's it's the truth and and i didn't know how to help how do you stop that when well, it's systemic it it seems that you now though have become an advocate yourself for people inmates like your father and um, I don't want to fast forward uh, too much, but I do want to make sure that we talk about uh, what happened at the at the end, because your dad actually was paroled. Tell me how that happened, whether or not it was surprising. Yeah, that, well, my dad had been up for parole several times in, in Texas. You have to serve half your sentence before you're eligible for parole. 
So year 10, he came up for parole and he didn't get it. And he thought for sure he was going to die from just the disappointment. And he's, and, and he didn't see a future for him, but, uh, I said, you know, you've got it every two years from here on out, you're going to get parole, uh, parole reviewed. So this is now a clock. You've got two years to get better and to work on the things that they didn't see in you. That means getting drug and alcohol treatment or domestic violence treatment, those kinds of things. But those things apparently were not available to him, partly because he was deaf. And there's, I don't know how many currently uh, are housed in Estelle that are deaf or and or blind, but there's certainly not a personal uh, interpreter for every deaf inmate. At one point, when he first went in, there were almost 200. It's definitely lower than that now, but um, there, he wasn't getting the treatment, but he also wasn't telling the truth about what had happened to him mm. and this woman. And oh, this goes back to what I started to say about how he'd never been violent with me. He, he um, was a blackout drunk and anytime he'd ever been violent was when he was drunk. And he, so when he'd wake up the next day, he'd see this black eye on this woman's face or now she's almost dead and he's in jail for attempted murder and be like, well, I didn't do that. No, he has no memory of it. So he had a very, very hard time reconciling the truth that yes, he had in fact done these things. He was so drunk and obliterated. Now you have to stay sober for that reason, because when you're sober, right. you don't do these things. Right. So why do you drink though? And so we talked over the uh, every two years he'd come up for parole. Every two years he was denied. And it was only recently when he had um, uh, the three years or four years left that they started to review him every year. And I guess it's because he's at the end of his sentence and maybe his age. I'm not sure exactly what the policies are, but um, I felt like this time he was going to get out. And it was because his teeth were in such terrible condition. And I had been rabble rousing, causing trouble. I was a ruckus. I was a, a troublemaker for them. I was haranguing them, calling them, harassing them, trying to get his medical records and trying to get him dental care. And um, he was in pain and he was losing weight from the lack of ability to eat. And then he was malnourished. He, his diet was Reese's cups and ramen noodles, and, you know, soft food. Mm. It's available from the commissary and the commissary, if you look at what they make available to you, it's not broccoli and lettuce, you know, it's, it's junk, it's candy right. and, and process. sugar. It's, yeah, yeah. Process. It's terrible. And so, um, unbeknownst to him and me, he had lung cancer in this last year and a half, at least I would say, because, um, it was very advanced when they did diagnose it. But in this last year and a half also is when we really had come, he had finally come to terms with the truth. When my book came out, he was very upset by it. So there was a lot of BS in it, you know, a lot of fake stories. And again, I feel like he just couldn't reconcile that this was true, that yes, he had indeed done these things. Right. And his, he had a friend a deaf man inside who was very close with him. And I had an in-person visit with my dad last year. And this deaf man also had an in-person visit with his brother at the same time. And we had kind of coordinated it to make sure we'd all be in the visiting room at the same time. So then the four of us would all be able to speak sign language to each other and introduce each other to our loved ones, that kind of thing. Yeah. And it, and it felt great. It felt like we were just hanging out, at a deaf club, you know, these hmm. old deaf clubs from back in the day. It was fun. It was nice. And, and the, the deaf inmate and I, um, we wrote to each other after the visit. He said, you know, meeting you, I, I decided I was going to read your book. Your dad had made me promise to never read it. And, you know, you don't want an, in, in, uh, an enemy inside. So, and your dad was a friend of mine and I didn't want to make an enemy so I promised him I never would. But after we met and we all grew up together in Texas, we're all in the deaf community. He, he felt, you know, you're you're like a sister. Your dad's like a father figure to me. You're like a sister. I, I'm going to read your book. So he bought it and read it in the middle of the night with a little flashlight so that no one would see him. 
And after he read it, well, he, wow. yeah, he carried around a lot of guilt. Hmm. And he said that he had also abused his loved one and that there's no way for them to talk about these things inside. There's no counselors. There's no deaf group. And so he and he was carrying it around. So he finally decided to come clean with my dad. And he told him the truth that, yeah, he had uh, he had read the book. And my dad was very upset, wouldn't talk to him for a few days, apparently. And he just pestered him. He kept pestering my dad saying, we've got to talk about this. Your your daughter talks about some things that I did, too. And I, I think it's common in the deaf community. And you, we really need to talk with each other about it because we have that deaf male rage. You've got it, right? You have it. You know what I mean? And then finally, my dad, he said that my dad just wouldn't look at him, but his chin wrinkled and he slowly started nodding and said, yeah, I have it. And so he finally wow. started talking about it. Yeah, it was like this, a tremendous breakthrough. And I'm so forever grateful for that, that man talking to my dad about it, because then I visited my dad a couple more times and we very, very long letters where I explained to him that this man was right. You have to talk about it, that it sounds okay, but the truth really does set you free. And that my, my book was a 331 page intervention letter. Read it again. And, and the inmate had told my dad that my, your daughter, so many letters and the longest letter she ever wrote you is called burn down the ground. You should read it. I'm going to cry. Sorry. Totally fine. I would just think how great, how great that man's understanding was. He understood it so well. But yeah, that's what it was. It was a 331 page letter. And when I had, when I had pitched the book to publishers here in New York, I had, uh, proposal that I took around to the publishers and I said, it's a love story. <laughs> you know, it's not a memoir. It's a love story. Well, I love that. I love it. And I love that you shared it with me. And I want to just ask you one final question, take your time, which is, um, Due to, as you wrote, uh, due to COVID-19, your dad's final days were spent alone in a hospital without an interpreter or an in-person visitation. And he learned to FaceTime after all of that. And and you yeah. had to say your final goodbyes in a five minute phone call where oh, someone terrible, at Pete. the prison. Yeah, please tell me about that. And then I'll. Well, there you go. I don't know how that he got so sick so fast. Uh, he had been complaining about his teeth and losing weight. And when I saw him in March, I went to visit him, a 24-hour whirlwind trip to go visit him mm -hmm. because we had really, we had really made a lot of breakthroughs and personal connections in, in our last two visits, but then also through letters through this other inmates uh, prodding and stuff. And, um, you know, I had, I, the last time we spoke, told you how I told my dad, listen, bad behavior is the language of the wounded. You were hurt. You were wounded deeply when you were a kid and growing up and you need to heal. You need to heal. And so I had vowed that I was going to go see my dad at least every six months, if not sooner or more often until he got out. But I knew he's getting out soon. So felt like between the letters and every six month visit in person, that would be good. We could get him out. And so March COVID was raging in New York city or it was yeah. coming our way. It was like a tsunami, like the wave, you can see it and you got the warning. So I went to Houston. I uh, went and visited my oncologist before I went and got a special mask to fly with. And I was the only one wearing a mask in oh, the wow. airport. I'm like you guys know there's a oh, pandemic, boy. right? Mm. Yeah, I know. No one was Houston. <laughs> we have a problem, but he, uh, <laughs> so I get to, <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, it just, I, uh, hack, but <laughs> no, I like it. Um, so I visited him and that visit was a surprise <clears throat> and he looked good, but he didn't know I was coming. So I surprised him and he was overwhelmed, overjoyed. And we, he hugged me 
and kissed me at the end and went in a way that made it feel like he, it was our last goodbye. It was mm. so special and so good. Oh, our whole so visit. It was, but yeah. it does make me wonder, did he know he was sick or was he feeling pain or had, um, but he didn't have a diagnosis of lung cancer until I'm not five sure. days before he died. I'm not sure that matters. Whether well, or not he knew. Right, right, right. Like maybe he knew something was wrong, but. Well, you'll never or, know, you know, yeah. you, you'll never know. And if that is the last time and for whatever his impetus was for it, I'm not sure that it matters. Sorry, yeah. to, sorry to be yeah. the, uh, the advice giver or judge of, <laughs> the, of that uh, moment. But it seems like if that's that, that moment can be what it is, you know. Yeah, and it was it, really great, though. And we both broke down in just tears and said goodbye oh, and hugged and good, kissed. And, good. Yeah, it was really great. And. Um, but he looked good. Uh, he didn't look thin, but now having looked at his medical records at that point, he had already lost 16 pounds, Hmm. uh, from November, he weighed 212 and in March he weighed 196. And then COVID hits New York city. He was terrified for me. He was like, please don't go to, when I went to the uh, marches and went and protested in, in Queens, he was, uh, don't go, don't go. Right. And, uh, don't go to QED in my theater. He, he was like, he, he volunteered to give me his pension, his entire pension hmm. to keep QED alive. And I was like, no, I will close QED. You keep your pension. I, you know, don't, don't do something stupid like that. But, um, so he was worried for me, and I'm like, Dad, I'm worried for you. You're living inside a Petri dish. You know, Stay away from everyone. Right. Do not go to the communal showers. Don't go to chow. Do not worry about calling me. He called me every day. We call, call, he talked to me every day, hmm. and we, had, we wrote each other every day too. So I would get a letter, sometimes two or three letters a day from him. And the mailman, when I, we – temporarily moved up to our cabin so i actually now know and see my mailman so he's like what's going on this is becoming a habit because like how many letters are going in and out yeah packages and stuff and i was like oh it's just my dad (laughs) we write a lot and he's like you don't say um so but yeah so we were calling every day and i was like dad do not call me anymore stay in your cell and he promised me he would do bird baths where he would just take a little bird bath in his cell instead right. of going to shower i'm like great do whatever you have to do you're gonna get out soon don't worry about it i wrote a letter to the parole board saying he's got a job he's got a place to live send him home and on uh june 11th he was approved for parole with restrictions that he take domestic violence and drug and alcohol training. And I'm like, that's the stuff I wanted him to take years ago. Are you kidding me? You want Mm. him to do that now in the middle of a pandemic? Send him home. I've got an iPad with a phone number set up for him. I can interpret for him. He doesn't have a personal interpreter in prison and they're in lockdown. So all these programs have been stopped. So I'm like, just if you just send him home, I can do all this with him here. Plus, right. he's starving. Now, at this point, he had started making a lot of noise about the Johnny Sacks, the sack lunches being un, un uh, eatable. What's the word? Uh, inedible. Uh, the hard peanut butter, like a tablespoon of peanut butter that was hard as rock, molded bread, food that was still frozen. And, and just completely unprepared. Now, in their defense, they're trying to feed 3,500 men three times a day sack lunches uh, while on reduced staff. But that said, they were still it was. Well, they, the bottom line is they bad. should re- they should let people out of prison that have been in that long that have that because of COVID nineteen that have the situation yeah. that you have and they, everybody wins, everybody saves money. Right. So yeah. I know. And then, uh, yeah, so he, at that point, he had, uh, was really making noise because he said, I, I'm Cambry, I'm losing more and more weight. And according to his records, by now, May 22nd, he was down to 170 pounds. So uh, 42 pounds from November. And we, so we got him an article in the Marshall Project. They, we got yeah. him quoted. And it was an expose. And it made a ruckus. It definitely caused good trouble, the kind that they, they immediate change in a lot of units, not in my dad's unit immediately, but in a lot of units. And we felt like he used his real name. He said, you know what? I am the warrior for the deaf and I'm putting my neck out there. And I, what do I have to lose? I'm already starving. I have no teeth. I can't eat. I'm desperate. Yeah. Use my name. 
So that's really he, brave. And I'll, and I'll share that article in the show mm-hmm. notes for this, for this episode. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so um, I, um, oh, well, go ahead. So there's one little thing that kind of is sticking in my craw and that, uh, that I want to investigate, which is when that article came out, mm-hmm. Marvin Dunbar of the TDCJ, uh, sent an administrator for these private family Facebook groups. She sent her a note to say, give me the names of the inmates that we're most concerned about and, you know, who, who's starving and who's complaining, whatever. So I gave her my dad's name. They went and did a wellness check on him. And then later, that administrator for the Facebook group scolded me. She chided me and said that you should do your due diligence. These He, was, he has gained weight. And uh, maybe he's exaggerating or wanting attention, but do, you know, you should do your due diligence, which now I'm seeing that he had already lost 40 pounds. And so somebody lied. And that's where I want to know who did the wellness check. Is this a retaliation because he went public? Mm. And yeah, somebody lied. So I'm very curious about that, but. Well, I gotta. I have to jump. I hate to end this interview because I have another oh, another person okay. that's about yeah, no to worries. that I that I have. I'm already a few minutes late for, but I did not want to stop this because this is so important and so good. So we'll just have to do part two, three, and four, and and find out yeah. what you find out because I know there's a lot more to talk about in terms of advocacy and COVID nineteen, right. especially yeah, in and Texas. Yeah, in the final days too. It was yeah. just really, really egregiously punitive for a dying deaf man and who had been paroled the way we were treated at the end. It was, it's, it's shameful, shameful, disgraceful. Have you written about so, yeah. that yet anywhere? The specifics about that? I'm writing that? an op-ed. I am not good, good at uh, banging it out because I've been so busy, but I'm uh, hopefully tonight and tomorrow is what I'm focused on. So well, I will let you know. Take your time with and, yeah. it and, and put, okay. put everything you got into it. And we'll just keep okay. talking. Cambry. I love yeah. you. I love talking Thank to you, you. And I really appreciate I you sharing so the story. It. Thank you, Pete. Right, and, well, and, and your camera, Caring makes a, uh, me feel great and it makes a big difference. Well, so your, you. your courage and your bravery and your honesty makes a huge difference to so many people. And this quote thank you. Um, that that I think you coined is so important. Bad behavior is the language of the wounded. And yeah. um, that resonated a lot with a lot of listeners last time. And, and uh, it's so important. I, and I think it yeah. well, everything you said uh, was so good. Uh, we'll you. talk again very soon, okay. my friend. Thank yep. you. Take care. All right. Bye. bye. Uh, so great. And I felt like I had a rusher out there and I felt bad about that. I apologize to her because I, I had scheduled somebody right right after her. My bad. I didn't quite get the arc of that interview the way I wanted, but we'll have to just have another conversation or many more conversations. Check out Cameron on Twitter if you enjoyed that. If you appreciated that, uh, check her out and let her know at Cambry K A. M-B-R-I. And thank you again to the great Jeff Jarvis, my father, Jeff Jarvis. Always great. And sorry to uh, Cameron Gabs. I'll get that interview on tomorrow, Cam. He is a new subscriber and listener, and I interviewed him for like an hour and 15 minutes because he's not sure who he wants to vote for, and he might vote for Trump. And we had this fascinating, uh, maddening argument. I want to share that with you tomorrow. Uh, I hope. Also have a lot more great guests lined up, but I am always want to hear who you want me to have on some great suggestions from listeners and subscribers. And I would love to keep getting them. So email me stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at Pete Dominic and Instagram and Facebook and all that. And of course, sign up for a paid subscription right now. If you haven't already, just go to patreoncom slash Pete Dominic or click on the paid subscription link in the show notes for this podcast. And as always, the last thing I like to say at the end of the show is that you are not alone. Someone, is going through what you're going through. Maybe lots of people. And let's look out for each other. Let's look for each other. Let's find each other. Let's love each other. I'll talk to you tomorrow right here on Stand Up.